Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War Two TV and a new week. And we have just three shows this these today and tomorrow before I kind of take a break for the D-Day festivities and commemorations, although I may be popping up with some live streams here and there from the site. We'll see how that goes. But today, um, if you're new to World War Two TV, don't forget to click subscribe, like the videos you're watching, leave us a comment both during the show. You can chat to us when we're broadcasting and leave a comment afterwards. And all the information you need, book links, social media links, is in the in the details below. So always expand that bit there. You'll find the links to my guests' books, the links to everything you need. And I say, welcome along to the week. So today we are part of uh, a week looking at the anniversary of the Normandy campaign, but not always D-Day. Today we're looking at the fighting later on, and we're looking at the fighting of a particular tank regiment. And my guest is something of a legend. Peter Hart was working in the Imperial War Museum for several decades in charge of working with the oral history projects, interviewing First World War veterans and then Second World War veterans. And he runs his podcast with his friend Gary. That is in the description below. And his latest book, which is out right now, Burning Steel, the a tank regiment at war. And I will bring him in right now. So um, good evening, Peter. How are you? I'm very well, Paul. Uh, delighted to be here. So very exciting for me, this live TV type stuff. <laughs> well, it's there's not millions watching this, but it is live TV. So, you know, I said it in the top of the show there, you know, you've had a massive experience interviewing veterans, and that will be something we'll be talking about because there's various ways of tackling Normandy history. You can look at the war diaries, you can walk the ground, you can look at all the operational studies of the 50s and 60s and all that kind of stuff, or you can simply look at what the blokes who were there said. So in this case, tell us about your background with um, interviewing veterans and how this particular project about the Fife and Four Fire Yeomanry came about. Well, I, I began as the First World War interviewer. Uh, at the War Museum back in 1981, January 1981, which is a long time ago. I'm pretty old these days. Uh, and it, it was it was a great job interviewing the Great War veterans. That was my main interest. But, of course, you can't keep doing that. And we moved on to Second World War interviewing. And while I was doing the First World War uh, project, what I noticed was that, ooh, um, there's a problem. You don't get – it was too late – in 1980, say, three, four, uh, to, to, to interview more than, say, one or two from each battalion. I was very interested in the first, seventh Northumberland Fusiliers, for instance. One, or possibly two, I can't remember now. That's all I got. And so when we came to do the Second World War, while my colleague Conrad Wood just did lots and lots and lots and lots of short interviews, I did, say, 50, 60 from one unit. Uh, so I did that for... Uh, um, an infantry regiment, we chose the Durham Light Infantry, who are the greatest fighting regiment, uh, I think, that, that you can think of, or, or I can think of. I'm from Durham, so I'm biased. But they had a lot of battalions. They fought everywhere. So we did lots of projects on, on, on each individual battalion within that fine regiment. Then for artillery, we did the South... Uh, uh, so the, the South Knots uh, uh, Yeomanry, and that was a 107 Regiment, Royal Artillery. And from the First World War, I'd conceived a massive impression that artillery is the key to the battlefield. And I'll be honest with you, I haven't lost that. And, and I think that the the British Army's improvement through through the war is to a large extent because they learned to concentrate their artillery to provide a massive mailed punch to, to, to get through and, and to also cover the gains. And they had to relearn the lessons of the Great War in many ways. And then, of course, there was tanks. Now, I wanted to do a tank regiment. Which one? Now, because I can't say Fife and Forfer. <laughs> I end up calling them Fife de Forfars, which is all wrong. I know everything's wrong. Um, but some people have said to me, oh, there's a, ooh, all sorts of things going on there. Uh, some people have said to me, uh, why didn't I do the third tank regiment, which I could pronounce? But I yeah. didn't because I was spending a lot of time. We, we'd had a baby and... Uh, we were in Edinburgh a lot because that's where her parents were. And it was handy for me to, to, to do a, a Scottish regiment. Also, when you're the War Museum, you have a responsibility to cover the whole country. You, you can't just do England. And so I thought, well, Scottish tank regiment, which one? Five and four for Yeomanry. Which one of the two? The second, because to me, they were the more interesting one. We did do a few of the first. Uh, and that meant uh, from Edinburgh, I could get to their heartlands, which, as you know or don't know, Dundee, Co can't say any of these places, probably. Cooper, <laughs> Tom Firmley, Kirkcaldy, I've no idea how you say. Uh, my favourite is Bratty Furry. I just have no idea how you, you pronounce that. But um, 
we did them. And then the great thing about the Fife and Forfers is that they had a very active south of the border association because like a lot of regiments, they as the war went on, they had more and more drafts coming in from elsewhere. So they weren't coming in from the heartlands. They were coming in from England, Wales, all over the bloody place. And that was great because uh, that meant I could complete the uh, the interview with at least half of them by the end were, were English or and we did a lot of them. But wherever they came from, I, I just got to say, interviewing them was an absolute pleasure. They were wonderful, wonderful men. They were fabulous to interview. They were kind. They were patient. They gave up their time. A session, one session is two hours if they were up to it physically. Uh, one session, two hours. Some of them I'd be going back five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. Uh, they were fabulous. And and they they, they 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 had two motives, I think. One, they were proud of their collective achievements as a regiment. They were. The second thing I really think was important to them was that, uh, well, I... <laughs> The people that died, a lot of it, it's not survivor guilt, but they really felt a responsibility to those that hadn't made it to, to make sure that their names were amended. They used to go through and, and, and name check their tank members who died. And I used to I, I always try in the book to, to find out where they're buried and just put a thing. So I don't know why I do it. It's just so you can think about visiting them when you go to the cemeteries so so that's that's the the origin of the, of the project um that, that, that's how it started um and it's been great great fun to do it and it's quite sad now that all but about two are dead jeff hayward's still alive and i think the bloke called harold wilson which causes me to smile a little but harold wilson was a five and four for i think he's still alive but i'm not sure about him i know jeff's alive because i spoke to him last week yeah. So there we go. And I talk too much. <laughs> and the other thing, of course, is that is that you would maybe be a bit humble about this, but speaking to veterans is a is an art. That they, you know, you, one of the worst things I can I occasionally do is you go on the internet and you find some university or college that's interviewed a few veterans, and it's they give standard questions and they don't react to what the person just says. They don't follow up, and they're not necessarily very sensitive. And you can get some good information from it, but really getting solid brilliant information it's all about the skill of the interviewer isn't it so if, if you were talking to someone now who was going to be out speaking to veterans peter hart's top two or three tips for speaking to a veteran and getting the, the best out of it oh well one interview them in the morning don't know what you're like paul i'm a lot better in the morning and i'm only 67 mornings don't eat with them don't waste time that you could spend interview because if you have a meal with an 80 year old 87 year old you're going to spend one two hours you know uh, but if you actually look at the interview then don't lead because old people are looking to please you so mm -hmm. if you lead them by saying uh it must i'll, I'll have to use first world war examples because it's so much where my head is um um it was cold in the trenches it must have been cold in the trenches was it cold they'll say yes it yeah. was cold but i was never cold <laughs> which it's just conscious yeah. because it goes you mustn't lead people and just because you think something um the sherman's a shit tank oh yeah well firstly that's up for debate because it's the only one they have that's my we'll perhaps come back to this but secondly if you say that to someone who's fought in it proud of what they achieved in it you can't say that they'll they'll you're not going to get the best out of them other 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 points i would say uh uh don't 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 go for sex. That'll immediately alienate him. Oral history. Sex just doesn't happen uh, because you, you, unless they want to tell you and then they're in trouble with their wives 10 minutes later. Um, but um, we used to have an example. Don't ask what it was like to bayonet someone. Be sensitive about what you're doing. This is not nice. And if you've ever, the chances of you bayoneting someone who wasn't a prisoner are fairly remote uh, or dying. Um, but really horrible things you've got to treat with care and you can hear me when people start to cry i switch the microphone off because i'm not media media love it when people cry if you could make me cry you'd love it wouldn't you paul you'd love it well we do, we're at, we're not like that are we so if if if, uh, if a little old man of 92 starts to cry in an interview i'll switch it i'll switch it off i'll get him a glass of water i'll settle him down i'll try once more a pass round it perhaps approaching from a different angle if i think it's important if he starts crying again i'll leave it because in the end they're human beings they have nightmares 
Paul. They really do have nightmares after you've seen them. If you've been describing, say, Goodwood or Epsom or Hill 112 or, uh, or, or the worst parts of Blue Coat, any of these things, or even just some incident no one's ever heard of in the last week of the war, it can really upset them. If it's their best mate that was killed or if they saw something that was just gut-wrenchingly horrible, that's that's what I think. Uh, I mean, so that's, that's a, a bit of advice. Point. Thank you for me to mention you know, the title of your book, Burning Steel, and we can talk about how that came about. But one of the points I wanted to make, we had a, a French historian on last week who's done a film, a short film about Operation Epsom, where he's done about a Highlander who, who, who went missing in the battle. And you know what we didn't do in that show was discuss the merits of Operation Epsom and how it was led and how it was commanded and was it the right plan and should they have done this and should they have done that? And that is a very valid debate. And there's lots of people who can talk about that. You and I, before went going live, we talked about people like John Buckley and the late Ian Dalgleish. They're the kind of people to tackle that. What you yeah. tackle, you tackle in this book brilliantly, is the perceptions of the guys who were in a tank division. That perception of, you know, uh, going out in a in a vehicle that you perceive as being outclassed by the Germans. That fear of of an 88 millimeter shell whizzing across a field and smashing into you. That that the, the burning of a of a tank beside you. So. Yeah, and that where you know your first world war idea of of the horror the horror of the trenches horror of tank warfare is something that i think gets a bit lost in the debates about whether or not the plan was good so if people are looking to your book to have a run through of the, the planning for operation epsom goodwood and blue coat then they're not going to find it are they well they're going to find an outline and that's it yeah. it's yeah. enough to inform you so that you understand what's going on uh and 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 my very very much i'm a believer that uh firstly i believe in the all arms uh i, I believe in the all arms battle theory anyway so i'm not a tank man I've, in fact if i'm anything i'm an artillery person uh but the point is that you you you, you look at, at 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 what what's going on uh and it, you You've got to. You can't just interview tank commanders or or, or or the loader wireless operator. You can't just interview the the gunners or the drivers, the co-drivers. You've got to do the store people as well. You've got to do the medic if you've got one, if you can find one. There's not many, of course. You've got to do everybody in it at every level of rank that you can, and and that way you get a picture of that armored regiment at war. Or or or, or, or and and I think that's absolutely crucial. Um, um, even with even with the, the advantage that we had, because we did the tanks last, we left it a bit late, Paul. It, it, when I started, they were over 70 years old. Now, uh, no, uh, they say that I'm 67, as I said, but they were over 70. And people say old soldiers never die. Well, they bloody well do. Uh, and you're losing them all the time. The greatest hero of the five and four for you only was a chap called William Steele Brown. He never used William uh, Steele Brown. He was uh, started as a second lieutenant, went through. I think he finished up a captain or a major. He was fantastic, but he was dead. He was dead before we started the project. I was very lucky that he left a brilliant uh, memoir, which uh, a French museum and the War Museum provided me with copies of, uh, co copies of a shout out to Rob Stout, who was very helpful with that. I don't know whether you know Rob, but there's lots of people are helpful when you're in trouble. <laughs> and um, it, 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 the other thing is, as people get older, their me their memories decline. There's no two ways about it. I mean, it it, it it's... If when it comes to some questions at the end of this, I think you might find my memories declined a bit because I wrote it two years ago. Uh, it, it, well, it, we're, we're all struggling with that. So, I mean, th th obviously, the book takes the regiment through from truck formation training all the way through to the end of the war. You know, the, the, the title image, you know, the cover image there, they went from Shermans and they had done Firefly and then Comets and other tanks later on. So, they, they saw a lot, did a lot during the, their time, but we're going to focus. A little bit on on Epsom, basically, because it's their first big baptism of fire in Normandy here. So, um, you know, for those, just to give a bit of an intro to those who don't understand the operation, there had been a couple of smaller operations. It's the first big set piece battle in Normandy after that build up period of getting the units across, and it's the kind of bulge out there towards the Odon Valley, uh, west of Con. You can see it on the image there, and it's the this is the beginning of 8th Corps. So this is the 49th Division, the 11th Armour Division, um, and what have you, who had not yet really seen combat in Normandy. This was their build-up. So what, how was Operation Epsom 
seen by the guys who were given it there you know there there they are they've arrived in norman they've done all their kind of deep waterproofing their vehicles they've got they've got kind of used to calvados and things like that for your average guy in the second battalion fife and fourth uh, yeomanry what what were they told operation epson was all about well they're given about they're given an outline of what they're meant to do which is uh the in the uh the 15th uh, highland division were meant to uh secure the crossing over the odon i do get it mixed up with the oda so don't don't be surprised if i've got that wrong and I'm, my eyesight isn't good enough to see on the map um but they were to get across the first river and then the 11th armored division would pass through to seize the second river and blah de blah blah um um, however, the wheels fell off straight away, as you well know. Uh, that splendid arrow from the 49th Division that you see on your screen pointed towards Raw Ray, which is what they call high ground. It's not, not the Alps, is it? But um, that 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 fails. That means that they're in trouble from the start. The resistance is fierce. Uh, the 15th uh, uh, um, uh, the Scots Highland Division, uh, whichever one they are, anyway, 15th Division, they... They, they don't cooperate well with the tanks they have with them, and the 11th Armoured Division is called forward. Uh, it's the, One of the themes of, of everyone in this battle is that they don't know what they're doing. They've trained and trained and trained and trained, and I've tried to cover that in the book because training makes a soldier, and you can't understand a soldier without looking at their training. But they really don't have a grip on it. They don't understand even the basics. They don't know that the officer doesn't lead the troop into action. The sergeant does, because if the first tank's blown up, you lose your leader and you're in trouble to start. They don't know that. They don't know uh, what, what, what they don't know how to cooperate with the infantry and um, this battle i don't care what the experts say one of the things that i think people like dalgleish and buckley make absolutely apparent is the total failure of cooperation between the tanks and the infantry and this comes across in the interviews they they do not know they cannot get you you don't get any sense the infantry are with them they're on their own on a battlefield and and of course tanks are very much on their own on a battlefield anyway uh, the communications are, are, are not great. And one of the things that I found most affecting, and time and time again, I, they mention it, you can see bugger all from a tank. Uh, yes, you've got the commander, the steel brownies of this world, uh, the uh, Pinky Hutchison's, the people that come up time and time again in the book, Charlie Workman. They are, their thing is, they're out the top. They are they're out the top looking. The rest of the tank crew get little peeps through the periscopes, little peaks of the slits. They can see bugger all, to use a very technical term now. Uh, and that's something that you get all all the time. So this is an this is this is like a first time in in action. And it's like most things that you do the first time. It's a right cock up to use several mixed metaphors. I'm afraid. And, and the answer. fact is. That they're in, they're encountering some German formations that actually are quite good at infantry, armor, uh, engineer, co coordination and cooperation because they've been fighting together in various shapes and forms for some time longer. So especially we know about the German camp and groups, the small unit kind of put together, hastily put together units that are very good at working together. And you, know, you and when we study the Battle of Normandy, you can definitely see the learning curve. You can see the British and the Canadians improving as they go through Epsom and then gradually on and Hill 112 and uh, Jupiter and and then Goodwood and Bluecoat. You can see that progression. But the first time out of the of the of the of the gate, so to speak, it is everybody's big, big steep learning curve. So you were going to share with us a couple of the of the quotes of the guys that you know. I, I am can I make one point first? People yes, criticize sir. the British armored formations and, and, and the infantry, but when the German reinforcements arrive, they're in a desk, you know, they're flung into action and they don't go into action properly coordinated and they suffer casualties as a result. So it's not just the British who occasionally crock up. Uh, the, the, the Germans, when they have to fling people into action without proper briefing and preparation, they also suffer. Uh, however, there's very little excuse because it was our offensive. So we should have been better focused yeah. and ready. Uh, now, you want a couple of quotes. Uh, can, I get, can I give a, a quote from Charlie? Charlie uh, Workman, lieutenant at that time. He's in one troop C squadron. Um, he was a fabulous bloke. I can't tell you, Paul, what a lovely man he was. He rose to be boss of the Territorial Intelligence Corps in post-war years. I interviewed him in Musselburgh, which is a 
uh, uh, quite a posh suburb of Edinburgh. Uh, he he was a he was a bright button. He really was. And you know, I say people. He was less senile then than I was when I interviewed him. I was about fifty. Uh, this is his quote of going into action on the twenty sixth of June, uh, roundabout sure. He says this. Uh, I'm not going to pretend to do any stupid accents. I'll just do that. I just to give you the clue. It's Scottish. He says this. The wireless traffic was going like mad. There was an 88 millimeter at so and so. There was something else at so and so. For the first time in my life, I saw German troops advancing towards us. They would be Panzer Grenadiers, part of 12th SS Panzer Division. This was quite a strong defensive line and we did it. We put the machine gun onto them. We were told the Germans never led with the officer. They regarded that as a waste. You could see who the officer was because people were looking at him. You had to try and kill the officers. Then their tanks opened up. We couldn't see them at all. They were hulled down. Sure was a shambles. The whole village was ruined. It was difficult to tell where the road was. We kept losing tanks. Hey, we lost seven that day in Sea Squadron. I could see them being hit. There'd suddenly be a flash and a tank on your left or right would go up. You saw the flames as they brewed up and you thought, that was just what happened. It was only later on you began to realize that these Shermans were brewers. We were firing. Now and again, you'd see a German tank moving and you'd engage that tank. It was such confusion. It was our first day in action. There was burning tanks, wounded men, constant shells going off all round you. It was pretty noisy. We couldn't get any further forward. Such a confused scene. One was never aware of being afraid. I think that was because we had so much to do. And as, as ever, with, I, I think there's always a humour in what people say. But I think that that section of an interview really gets across to you just just what it's like the frenetic nature of it yeah exactly and it and it it goes so it sits very differently to those accounts where people talk about well the plan didn't do this and this arrow it's all about arrows on maps and 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 i and i enjoy those discussions myself they're very yeah, valid they i enjoy talking about what eighth core did and what so and so did but there's nothing like hearing it from the point of view of someone as you said their lieutenant there so he theoretically kind of knows what's going on. He's in a position where he should have some idea what's going on. And yet for them, it's that reality of trundling across the wheat fields towards sure. And I was in sure cup a few days ago. You know, it was, as you said, it was leveled. It was nothing left of it against all this, this, this hull down armor. So let's, we can go back to some quotes in a minute. I want to get across what your kind of the, the, with the 50 interviews or so you took, what the consensus was about perceptions, because we could have one of the armored division experts on and talk about the fact, you know what, a regular Sherman tank can knock out a Tiger, and you know, Panzer IV isn't is vulnerable to this, is vulnerable to that. That that's the that kind of stuff we've worked out in recent years. Jonathan Ware has been on a guest on the channel, can break that stuff down. But if you are in the a unit like the 27th Armored Brigade, what are your perceptions of the German armor you're facing? Perceptions they gave me. Uh, was that a Sherman could deal with a Mark IV? Definitely, definitely was equal to it. Uh, um, that was their uh, their thing. They thought it would take two or three Shermans to deal with the Panther. They really rated the Panther and the Tiger. They called for the uh, the Air Force, the the Typhoons. That was their perception of it, uh, and uh, I respect that perception. However, however, one of the things you notice, Paul, is that. Perceptions aren't always reality. Now, I'm, I'm not in disagreement with Jonathan Ware about this. For a start, every tank on the battlefield is a Panther or a Tiger. Yeah. You never get the Mark IVs mentioned. Or or, 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 or Stugs. Or and Stugs. Mark. And, yeah. and every anti, you never get the, I've forgotten the name of it. Uh, the um, You only get the 88 millimeter. You don't get the, uh, 70, uh, the, the others. I've, Christ or 75s and 50s yeah. And yeah yeah no, exactly. everything is a 88 millimeter everything's a target everything's a panther um and that's because do, do you blame all i'm saying to you is you you pe you're a driver you're peering through that you, you're peering through a little hole or, or a periscope you see a tank for 10 seconds and the buggers firing at you can you actually put your hand on your heart and say that you would be able to identify that tank using your noddy and big ears bug of tanks and say, oh, yes, well, that was a Mark IV. Or would you say, fucking hell, it's a tiger. And I know I've sworn there, but that is what they would exactly. say. 
I, I, I will relate a brief story to you, then I'll let go back to you. I was in Hoofalese in the Ardennes years ago with a 101st Airborne veteran who'd fought through the Battle of the Ardennes, bet with you know, all sorts of tanks bearing down him. One of the people on my trip was standing in front of the Panther there and said, you know what? It isn't as big as I thought it would be, having seen it in the books. And Don, the veteran, basically punched him on the nose and said, have one of those fuckers come at you out the fog through a wood and tell me it doesn't look big. And that kind of illustrates that idea that when you're going through smoke and there's artillery fire behind you, and as you said there, you see through your little periscope a tank. And let's be honest, the Panzer IV has a very similar profile to a Tiger, just there's a size difference. But how can you perceive distance when you're looking for all that smoke there and tell people that they did it didn't seem like a tiger well they can't they can't uh, the, the, the 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 thing is that people sometimes have a go at oral history oh well, can i make a general point about oral history and, and about its accuracy look oral history has faults uh right memory lying not often but uh, yes that's uh, <laughs> um but the, the truth is if you for me, if you're a historian, you look at all sorts of evidence. So I didn't only do oral history. I looked at the war diary. Um, now, what is the war diary, Paul? Do you think it's a completely impartial record of what happens? Or do you think it's what the intelligence officer or the adjutant writes down to please the colonel and keep the regiment out of trouble? Which do you think it is? Well, it's, it's more likely to be the second. But even between the regiments, depending on the kind of person who's writing those war diaries, there's a big difference. Some it's like, what? What's the minimum I can get away with to get back on my real job? A few Attack lines that will do. Yeah. Other people, I, I forget which unit I was reading not that long ago. Well, I think the guy was a poet and he didn't know it. And he was writing these long kind of really kind of, you know, going through his thesaurus for really colorful language. I was thinking that's so different. I mean, they're, they are what they are. You have to use them in conjunction with other things. And, and That's right. Yeah. But can I also go, people also say, oh, I, I remember one, first of all, example, somebody said, well, I, I'm only going to use contemporary accounts of uh, Palestine because the, anything else is after the event. And I looked in the index, there's no mention of dysentery. Do you know why? Because when you write home to mum, you don't write, shat myself 15 times today with dysentery, do you? you do no. you write to your girlfriend, uh, so, you know, Co pants covered in shit. You know, I'm thinking of Gallipoli in particular now. I always think of Gallipoli. But you see what I mean? Uh, letters. Also, it depends who you write to. You write to your father or your brother, you might say what happened. You write to your mum, everything's going fine. It's all right. It's going It's going well. Um, if you write... If, diaries. Diaries. You are the hero. If you kept a diary, Paul, you'd be the hero of it. And what's more... Had Peter Hart on the show. What a wanker, you know. And then two weeks later, we meet on the battlefield, have a good time. Oh, met Pete. Oh, nice, seems nice guy in the pub. Do you see what I mean? It's not. It's not even consistent. The human being. So all history is just one one thing. And what it's really, really good for is mundane detail. Do you know what? It's not that great for battle detail unless they happen to have a very good memory. What it is is what is uh, what is a lager. How do they do it? How do they load the guns? How do how do they fire the guns? Uh, what ammunition? How do they store the ammunition? Yes, it's in books, but it's a bit dry. Uh, and you get amusing anecdotes that illustrate these points. And 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 that to me is what it's all about. But you can't use one source without the others. And I know I absolutely take on board what you say about war diaries are different. But one thing I'll tell you is. The British Army normally in the First World War, sorry about this First World War thing, uh, report from right to left. And the number of times the uniform on the right, the, sorry, the unit on the right retreats and so they conform. <laughs> and it's not. They've all run away at the same time. That Do you see what I mean? That's, that's the reality of it. You have to join the war diary, personal experience accounts, letters, diaries, and try and get a balance of probability. If I said to you that I was in central London in the War Museum this morning, prove me wrong in 50 years. Do you mm, see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You could only ever get a balance of probability. I'm not saying that everything in my book is exactly right. But what it is, is from what I've done, it's a balance it, it, it gives, to me, the, the small t truth. This is what it was like, and that's what I tried to do. And and, and when, you, when I say I, it's the lads who did it. I, I only string it together. They, they did and all you said, the hard You see in your introduction to the book, you know, that, that you, had, you were 
you had the, the wonderful fact of interviewing 50 people to get the, the, the source material. But with 50, of course, comes the fact that five of them in one battle will talk about it in five different ways because of where they were, how they remember it, and just their own unique way their own brains work. And it's so while we're talking about it, we've got the image up there of Operation Epsom. So here we're, we're back to this idea of, of bulges and arrows and who gained what and who did this. And, and, and of course, famously, they ended up moving forward and the elements of the advance got to Hill 112 and then they had to pull back. And that, that's yep. been a debate ever since is whether or not they had enough strength to take it. But I want to. I, what we're here today is to concentrate on these these accounts you got. So you've got another one from the same guy from Charlie Workman about about after the battle. He was, um, you know, he, he was talking about what happened the unbelievably bad day. So would you like to read us that one? Well, this is this is this is um, this is. It sort of occurs more after Goodwood, I think, because he mentioned okay. someone who's killed at Goodwood. I'm going to read that because I think this one's brilliant. Yeah, the Charlie Workman again. He says we discuss what the. Oh, sorry, I. We discussed what the life expectancy of a troop leader was. We could see it wasn't very long. We were all young and, I suppose, more malleable. I don't think anybody minded being killed. It was how you were killed. The thing I always had was I didn't want to lose my eyes. I could accept losing an arm or a leg, and we saw plenty of that. The Sherman had its ammunition exposed in the top. There was no lid on the bin. So when a Sherman was hit, it blew up. And very often the tank commander had his legs away. That's what happened to Chris Nichols, exactly like that. I saw his tank was brewed up. I saw him try to get out, and then he fell back in again. And that was it. Now, I want to mention Charlie Nichols was the, the major brought in under Montgomery's system that they had to have new commander. One, at least, um, uh, squadron commander had to be a vet desert veteran. And Charles Nichols, although he was quite nervy by this time and he had an inkling of his death, he was brought in and, and he did a good job before he was killed. Anyway, he got a workman goes on to say, in action, one never had any fear. A tank commander was too busy. You are watching your map, looking at your own troop. You are talking to your own driver. Go slow. Turn left. Stop. You are telling your drone gunner, traverse left, traverse right. Pick up the target. Your wireless operator would be giving you instructions. You were so busy. But the worst of it was, was when you came out and you were looking around to see who was still there what friends you had left. Then you would be told who'd gone. That was the worst bit afterwards. And of course, after Goodwood, that is horrendous because even the ones who survived at Goodwood, uh, the, 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 the tanks are blown up, but they survive because they, they make it. Uh, they bombed that night at the uh, glider field at Ranville, which of course, we, even I know where that is, if you know what I mean. I don't pretend to be a Second World War expert. So there you go. Um, terrible, terrible things. Um, so, you know, uh, you mentioned this, you know, that last account you read about the fear of burning vehicles. So going back to when you conducted these interviews back, whatever it was, no, as a historian no, going into this, I know, I know you were First World War historian primarily, but we, st you still would have grown up like I grew up with his ideas from the from the comics and the so and so and the, and we all know the terms, the Tommy Cooker and the Ronson and this idea that Sherman tanks blow up all the time and of course again people have now said you know what they didn't actually blow up all the time and that didn't happen as much as people think it did but there are these accounts that you are reading to us of, of that's what they were seeing that's what they were perceiving that was what their fear was so going back to the interview process how how do you bring up or do you wait for them to bring up the idea of what happens when a tank gets here because you're not going to say to them so what was it like seeing your best friend's charred body hanging no. out of a tank you, how what do you do you that to come up what I normally did was ask them to give an account of the battle right. in as much detail as they can. And while they do it, I'll make notes of certain things and I'll try and ask them to explain uh, the bits that I don't understand that I think people like you, Paul, and I later on would want to know. Uh, that can lead to somewhat insensitive question, I, I suppose, but I try and keep it, I try and keep it okay if, if you see what I mean. Um, sometimes you just can't answer a question, you ask a question too closely. I'm, I'm. If anyone tells you that Sherman's weren't Ronsons and Tommy Cookers, I would say I, I don't care what the research says. The guys who were in them are pretty convinced they were. And uh, what happened to to the um, the the five and four five yeomanry at Goodwood does seem to indicate they did catch fire. The fact is that often they got out. No, yeah. they. I mean, I'm sorry, but that that's a true. You see, if you're caught. Or if it penetrates and whizzes around and turns you to soup, fine, you're dead. But if, 
you often had a bit of time and and there's there's um there's 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 quite a few accounts where they describe having time to get out uh when you get out you can be machine gunned by the bloody germans uh of course you've still got to get back and as i mentioned they then bomb the next night but it, being hit in a, in a sherman doesn't mean it goes woof like that they're not ronsons they don't always like first time the other thing is in defense of the sherman what would you have used i mean what other tanks did we have? And I but, find this difficult. It's like saying, well, the Mark IV in 1916 wasn't a very, Mark 17 wasn't a very good tank. That's all they had. Uh, why didn't they have a Tiger tank? Because they hadn't invented it. And for me, the Sherman is a useful weapon of war. It had done, I think, well in, uh, in, uh, in North Africa. I think it did okay in Italy. I, I think it, do you know what? I think it did... If they didn't use it in a completely moronic, hello, Montgomery, and stupid fashion, like in Operation Goodwood, I think they did well. Operation Blue Coat, they do well. They do very well in Operation Blue Coat, in my opinion. My opinion as a non-expert. And I don't want to say I'm an expert on the second world war because I'm plainly not. I have read a lot now and I, I've interviewed a lot, but that's not my, my primary. If you look behind me, they're all books on the First World War. Uh, my, my Second World War is three shelves over there, and they're mainly related to these the, the regiments I've done. But the, but it, it, you, one of our regular viewers, the Great Dominion, is saying all Shermans had the wet ammo storage by this time. So this is the idea that the theoretically the 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 the, the fact that made Shermans brew up has been cured by the Normandy campaign. Um, but well, I, I they don't mention the wet ammo storage and and um, and. Uh, I'm I'm happy to be told that it is so. Um, uh, people often take shortcuts. I'll tell you that, and uh, I'm uh, and uh, I'm not. I don't know anything about the wet ammo storage. So I mean, the fact is, is that you're, uh, you've they've the, not your mentioned book, it. Your book is full of the fact that these guys were experiencing what they were experiencing. We're back to the initial point we made about perceptions of what. These guys, these 50 guys you spoke to who are representing the entire regiment at various points. So how many men went through that battalion in World War II? Let's say it was one and a half thousand, two thousand, whatever it was with replacement. You, th those 50 voices are echoing the voices of all those people. And that was, from what your research was, their collective shared wisdom. Now, maybe we can address it now and say some of their shared wisdom, we can say, well, that actually wasn't the case technically because they changed that there. It doesn't matter. That, that, that what they saw is what they what they experienced and what their fears were. I'll tell you what, he's put his finger on something I didn't notice in anything. Uh, the wet ammunition storage is interesting. I'm quite interested in that. Uh, what I do know is, whatever reason they may give, the Shermans did catch fire. Uh, there are pictures of them burning. There, yep. there are innumerable yeah. stories of them burning at goodwood and uh, it's all i've got one awful story if you want i can read it or not read it it's 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 yeah, please do please please read it yeah well, this is the, this is the final one from charlie workman it's gut-wrenching uh and in the book i have to make it quite clear that he, he takes this out of the time sequence uh, because I think he didn't want it possible to identify who the person is in it. And I, I fully endorse this, and I didn't try and find out who he was. Charlie Workman says this, We were advancing through a cornfield. There was a bang, and I was brewed up. The tank wasn't on fire, see, but I was literally blown out of my tank. I came to on the ground. I was quite uninjured. The sun was shining, the cornfield all around. There was a sack lying beside me. Then this sack of stuff started screaming at me shoot me shoot me sir i've been a good soldier please i can't stand this agony please please shoot me this was my driver who had been very badly burned up i took out my revolver and i couldn't find a face i couldn't find anything there was nothing left of him except a voice i was prepared to shoot him in the end luckily the voice died away and he died now i, I remember him telling me that and I'll tell you now, a sack lying beside me, it's, it's, it's something that's stuck with me ever since. I mean, I knew, I remembered that 20 years later when I, before I started listening to the interviews again, I remembered him telling me that. I remember the look on his bloody face. And uh, do I believe that story? Because I can't pay, I can't place the man. I can't place the incident. I can't. Uh, and I'm not, I, but 
I suppose a, a better, harder working expert than me could have gone through everybody, you know, but I, mm. I don't have the time for that sort of stuff. Uh, and also, I think, do you know, if Charlie Workman didn't want us to know who he was, do, would you think his, his daughter, his son and daughter might still be alive? Yeah. Would they yeah. like to know how he died? I, I don't think they would. So you have to have a little bit of sensitivity. And Char um, people will tell you I'm pretty insensitive. But uh, um, I, I think Charlie Workman's right here. I mean, yeah. and this is the thing. There, there, there's a time and a place to discuss the improvement of models in the Sherman and how they rectified things that had been an issue and they gradually got better. And I think, you know, it, it wasn't the very best tank of the world war by any means, but we didn't throw out the baby with the bath water. We'd had it, we'd started developing it and we kept, we kept on working at it like we did the Churchill, like we did other tanks until they became a better thing than they were when they started. It's not like you can go halfway through the war and say, well, we're, we're going to take all these factories that are now churning out this stuff, all these chassis we've designed and abandon that and start again from scratch. We persisted with it until it worked. So that it is, but that is separate to what you're mainly doing, which is yeah. relaying the experiences of these I mean, guys who went there. And I think the thing we're, getting, we're kind of getting muddled up is the idea of a Sherman instantly burning and an idea of a Sherman burning slowly. And I think that's that's where we're kind of entering into a slight difference of... Um, yeah. And a, if you're a, caught in it and, and the damage to a tank can be such that you can't get out or you're on soft ground, you can't go below, you're front, you, you've got to get... Sometimes you just don't have time. Um yeah, uh, one thing, of course, one development is the Firefly, the 17 pounder Firefly, which is a Sherman with a big, bigger bangy thing. So, if I get too technical, Paul, just tell me. Um, yeah, I can cope with that bigger bangy yeah. thing, yeah. And, uh, and you know, that's funny, but isn't it fascinating? Time and time again in the interviews, there's people like Steel Brownlee, that's a book, but I mean, it's a, an account. He says, Where is the effing uh, Firefly? Because they were kept back and then brought forward. How about timing? How do you time when to bring that Firefly forward when you're trying to deal with a Mark IV that's firing at you now? And, of course, it's three, four, five hundred yards behind. By the time it gets there, it's too late. And, and still, Brownie was vituperative, vituperative about the NCO who oh, ran his... Uh, yeah. And I have to put in the book, I have to say, in case his relatives read it, I have to say, this is an annoyed young officer, and he's annoyed with good reason. <laughs> Canadian military, so you're an idiot. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just that, that's, that's, he runs right. another great time. He's he's another fan of yours. And I, I mean, this is where we're back. This idea of what a, what is the purpose of a book? Because I've got a shelf of books about the the battles in Normandy from the British point of view, and some of them are those technical aerial photos, progression of this unit through from 1,000 hours to 1,200 hours, and they're great. And then there's other accounts by, I'm thinking of just, you know, the, the Leslie Skinner, the chaplain who's attached to the um, show at Rangers, and, you know, the part chaplain who's going in there, pulling out, burning, burning corpses and things like that and burying people. And they're giving you total uh, uh, different views of the campaign in Normandy. One is an operational study of what we're doing here. And one is a, this is what it was like for the guys who had to clear up the mess. And, and, and I think you're quite clear with your book at the beginning what it is. And what yeah. it isn't, your book. And yeah, and it's down to this it. idea of, of it being the experience of the guys. Balanced, of course, with, as I say, your idea of trying to get as close to the truth with a with a little T as possible. Um, and so, you know... Well, well this, is where, this is where people like uh, uh, Buckley, in particular, Napier... I like Victory in the... I know you lot don't like it. Victory in the West, I find it quite clear. Ellis, um, uh, Dunphy. But most of all, I found Ian Dag 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 Taglish. Uh, you know, these are these are guys who know so much more than we do. And you, draw, you can get... For me, I was able to get a balance of probability of what was happening on the battlefield that satisfied me so that I could put fit in the lads' experiences within what I call an outline. Uh, does it go beyond an outline? Is there any point in asking me a detail about one of these battles? No, there isn't, because I'm not going to know. Uh, you want to ask me about Gallipoli? Fine. You ask me about the Somme? Fine. Uh, no, don't. Because <laughs> some bastard will ask me something really difficult. But you do see what I mean, don't you, Paul? Absolutely. So, you know, we'll, we'll bring it back to, the, to the, the, the value of oral histories and the value of what, you know, what... This is a kind of a t terrible interview as a question, but you know, for the people who are watching this, who who I who tell me off all the time for telling them what how many books to buy, and I'm I'm affecting people's marriages and their bank balances and their the 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 weight on their bookshelves. 
So Burning Steel, what, what was when you set out to write it, what kind of book did he want it to be and what impression did he want it to have on, on the readers? What, what, was, what would you want their takeaway to be? I want them to know what it's like to be in an armored regiment, a tank regiment at war. It's exact. Do you know the subtitle? We, you can't put the name of the regiment. And, and my colleague, uh, James Holland, also doesn't put the name. Put the name of the unit in, it won't sell. But I want people to know what it's like. That's what I want. I want them to know why the, these things happen to them. And that's why we have the outline. Why is this happening to me? Is sort of. That's a question you have to answer, but mainly I want them to know what it's like and 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 to 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 to, to just give that feeling. But, uh, Paul, we've been lucky enough, most of us, th those who didn't serve in Northern Ireland or Iraq uh, or Afghanistan, uh, and that's not many out of the, the, the. Not many had to serve in those places. The regular army is small, uh, and the TA, you know. But most of us, people like me, have grown up n not having any of this, and and for me, this. Brings it home what these men suffered. And, you know, one of the real things that I find, and, you know, I'm a bloody lefty. I've probably got half of them switch off now. Uh, and I know you're a bit of a lefty as well. And I, 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 I I'm more than a bit. Yeah. Uh, and along with, as you point out, many other historians of, of both world wars. But I want people to realize that these were ordinary men. And there's loads of quotes at the end. They didn't particularly want to go into action, but they had to. It was their time. Uh, it was their that the date of their birth sort of determines that they're going to be in the bloody war and they're going to do their best just to do it. And, and what the, you see, they are fighting an absolutely evil empire. Now people are, People try and tell you things aren't. Oh, actually, the First World War Germans weren't that nice. But the Second World War Nazis are really quite baddies. And uh, these people give their lives. And the, the, all the names of those people that, that die, I, I tend to think of. And they die doing something I've never had to do. They die giving their lives for us. Uh, it's a cliched sentiment. But actually, if you're a military historian, you should have some respect for those people you're writing about. People say, oh, there's a lot, far too much of me going, aye, and stupid accents. But actually, underneath that daftness, that I feel that is a genuine thing. Uh, respect for uh, the sacrifice of people. And not everyone who came back was in the same state as when they left. People have depression, people have nerves, people have the screaming ad jabs. And as I said, after an interview session, they often said, oh, I had terrible nightmares last night. And, and because it brings it back, you're back in a bloody tank. There's, there's one thing I particularly remember, um, William Steele Brownie. he wrote this. Uh, can I just read this? Uh, why? Why? Because it really echoed with me. It was, I was going to make it my last point, but it's so relevant now. William Steele Brownie, he says, out of all the mishmash of memories, I have one that is vivid when I walk the dog of an evening. If the wind is blowing quietly through the trees and everything else is still, I physically feel what it was like to be in a field in Normandy at the end of a day. Not mentally, just physically. It's a strange feeling. And th these guys had to live with it for the rest of their lives. Um, I've never had to experience or do anything like that. And so uh, I, yeah. I just want that story told. And uh, I think I think I think I've managed to do a decent job with the help of all those people. And I'm just patting the books, the help of all those people who've gone before me uh, writing what I regard to be excellent histories, particularly Buckley. I, I was very impressed. Yeah, by John's a great guy. Uh, so, uh, you know, you you said earlier you've you've written about artillery regiments you've written particularly in the first world war about about infantry regiments and you said that you wanted to convey what it's like to be in a, a tank regiment in world war 2 so there's the question to you in a couple of sentences what was it like being in a tank regiment how did your average experience of a guy in a tank unit differentiate from those in infantry or the artillery or royal army service corps what what were the unique factors that these men shared what were the common denominators of what it was like? And I know you said it's not just about the, the men in the tank. It's about the support people and the, re the recovery and the repairs. But what, what defines people in a tank regiment? I think it's the horror of being in that enclosed space and a target for everything that's moving. Um, infantry will not get into tanks. They'll, they'll ride on the back of it. They don't like being taken, even when they're wounded. There's a couple of accounts in the book 
one of them is so gut wrenching that I just couldn't include it for you. I just thought it was too horrible for you. you know, and your listeners are a pretty tough bunch, you told me, but I just thought it was they're, they're it was, pretty hardy, yeah. But I mean, it, and that's yeah. gratuitous. It, it was horrible, it was gratuitous, and it mentioned someone's name. But in a, a tank was a target. Now, I am then they're an important part of the all arms weapon, but the infantry have, I still think. Gary Bain, he can shut up. <laughs> uh, stop putting me off, Gary. The, the infantry have, to me, the worst role. I'll be absolutely honest with you. I'm writing a book now on the 16th Durham Light Infantry who fought through North, Af uh, through, uh, North Africa and Sejanane and then into Italy and, and then Greece. And they have the worst job. They are no arm around them. They're not as much a target, but they, they, they can be hit by machine gun bullets. They have to take the ground. Artillery and uh, and tanks can't hold ground. Tanks have to go back and lager or get, they have to have fuel and ammunition, re-ammunition. They can't do that in contact with the enemy. They have to pull back to lager. I know there are exceptions to this before anybody bloody tells me, but generally, for instance, Hill 112, uh, yeah. generally they have to pull back to a lager. Um, so, so I think they're all. They're, for me, it's the the horror of knowing a shell could come through, um, and and it, and they know one of their first experiences. They arrive in France, and it's they're sort of sat in this field. They're not gone into action before Epsom, and uh, there's um there's a, a couple of tanks burnt out tanks in the, the thing, and they go and have a look, and it's Sherman, one of them, and the the shell has gone not only through. The armor, it's gone through the extra plate armor they put on the outside. And uh, they thought, well, that look, that, that plate armor that seems the extra bit seems to act as a sort of target. Aim here. They're trying to protect this bit. And I just think tanks are uh, claustrophobic. Uh, if you are hit, you're in trouble. Uh, you've only got a few seconds to get out. If you're wounded, if you, you're hitting the legs like Chris Nichols was. You can try. He, climbed, he got halfway out. He was witnessed by several of them, climbed his way halfway out and then just fell back and it was by then on fire. What a way to die. Brave man. I mean, so that for me is the difference. I mean, one of the weird things, I've never been in the army. I've never served. I just talk about this shit. I don't do it. But one of the things that about an infantryman's life that niggles in my head is that there's a certain part of it where you maybe feel your destiny's in your own hands a little bit in that although you're walking across a field and you're you're spaced out at 10 yards you can decide where you place your feet and whether you go to the left of that little dip or the right of that dip you can kind of adjust your pace so if, if you if you screw up it's kind of your own fault the thing that that, that that strikes me about a tank crew is you're dependent on three or four other people there and I think we have this idea that tank crew stays together all through the war. But of course, as you explain, you know, a tank gets hit and the radio operator is in hospital or he's out. So you get a new gun and they're cobbling together crews. So there's a familiarity, but it, there's always this kind of turnstiles at it, you know, a thing with a regiment where people are coming through and a turnover. So you're relying on someone in this incredible claustrophobic in environment for someone that you, you you're only really on nodding terms with because you met him that morning. And to me, that terrifies me. It is. And you're being guided by the uh, officer. So your troop officer is guiding you. So, you, you, you know, you, even your tank commander is often being told where to go, what to do. And, you know, somebody somebody on an 88 millimeter, I see I'm as bad as them. Let's say a 75 millimeter. So on a 75 millimeter, adjust the, that little bit of a wheel and it's life or death. If that shell hits a Sherman, it's going to do damage. It might not. It's, it's not instant death if a shell hits a Sherman. I absolutely endorse that. But it's not going to do the Sherman any good. And there's a fair chance someone in the tank is going to get hurt. That's all I'm saying. Uh, yeah, and okay. it could be all of them. And it could be none of them or, or just one slightly wounded, you know. Well, this is the, you know, the James Holland talks about it. We talks about Operation Goodwood, that, and, I, and I forget the exact figures, but the British lose, let's say, it's 370 tanks that day, and the Germans lose 170 or something. And so clearly the British have lost the more tanks. But it's all about the definition of the word lost, isn't it? Because a oh, number yeah. of those tanks are back in the, in, the, in, the, in the regiment the next day. Some are towed back and they're back in the next week. But if you're in a tank, whether it's hit by something small that only takes a track off or whether it blows the turret off, it still must be about the most terrifying thing that's ever going to happen to a human being in their life. That the, that feeling 
and whether whether the world kind of slows down when you know there's that incoming shell hit coming your way and is it going to hit you on the side is it going to hit you on the top there lost there's a way of reading it as a military historian that makes it sound rather more kind of mathematical than the experiences that you relay of these guys actually being it when a tank is hit and how awful that is can I give an example? This is uh, James Donovan, Trooper James Donovan, very similar name to James Holland. Well, actually, one name entirely different, but there you go. Uh, he's in B. Can I just give this quote? Because actually, it gives what you say. He says this, looking through the periscope. Oh, sorry. I Looking through the periscope, I saw two tanks moving up behind the hedge, facing us. You could just see the tops of the turrets. I said on the intercom to the crew commander, there's a tank on our left. One of the crew commanders, German crew commanders, was actually combing his hair. He was so unconcerned. I don't think he'd seen us. I can picture him now. He had blonde hair. Pretty German, of course. <laughs> he picked a field hat up and put it on. And I realized they were German tanks and not ours. They were Panthers. Of course they were. <laughs> Sorry, that's me. We started to reverse, and the crew commander brought the gun around onto them. They'd seen us by then. The first one came crashing through the hedge in front of us, 40 to 50 yards away. As he came through the hedge, our gunner fired and hit him. We saw the tracer from our shell come off the front and just zoom off into the air. He bounced off as our driver was reversing. You could see the gun of their tank come round and woof! It came through the front somewhere. There was a hell of a noise. You don't know what it is. It all happens within seconds. The next thing we heard was bail out! I was in the co-driver's seat. I turned round and kicked the release on the escape hatch and the floor behind me. My thoughts were if we go out through the front, they'll just shoot us down. I kicked the lever over and the escape hatch dropped and Dave Sutherland Sutherland and myself went through and the others came out of the terror. As we crawled back, boiling water was coming down. It must have gone through the radiators. But all five of us got out and got to the back of the tank. And then I love it. This is oral history. A bit of humor. He says, officers used to get issued with a bottle of whiskey every now and again. And Lieutenant Black had a bottle he used to share with his crew. The radio operator got into the back of the tank when he came out of the turret, and he's leaning back into the tank as it started to catch fire, trying to retrieve the bottle of whiskey. Now, I absolutely love that because you've just had this really, to me, it's just so realistic and, yeah. and the shock and horror of it. Notice it doesn't catch fire immediately. They've yeah. all got time to bail out. Is the Sherman in operation? No. Could it be rescued? I don't know. It probably was, actually, from the sound of that. But to me, and then the humour. And uh, I I love, I, I think humour is important uh, when and you're dealing that's with this. The point is that in a, in a data-driven statistical study of that tank battle, the column would read, tank lost, let's say it says, recovered within 48 hours, five crews survived. That's how it would say it. But that account you read, basically paints an entirely different, far more dramatic, far more brown-trousered account, really. As my great-uncle, who was an infantry in the Battle of, of Ch uh, Charmwood, he said, I lost 40, four pounds in weight, all of it brown, he said, when he went into combat for the first time. And that's the thing, isn't it? That is That account vividly explains what it's actually like going in and seeing some German combing his hair and then a shell coming through and tracer. The, the statistical analysis that is wonderful. I love reading those accounts. I love those people who squirrel away like Jonathan Ware and John Buckley, who look at all the data and they look at all the regiments' losses and they go, we can now say that 26% of shells fired within 1,000 yards did this and that. That's fantastic. It's the bread it and butter of the work we're using going forward. But it's very different to, to hearing an account of some poor sod who was in that battle scared shitless. Yeah, and uh, that for me is what it's all about. I, I, I think it, it's... It's my life's work in many ways. I mean, I, I want to again pay tribute to the war before, you know, because the war museum, I, this isn't me sort of deciding to do this. It was my project and I sort of conceived it and worked it, did most of the interviews. But the point was the war museum, I was a paid employee. Uh, you know, it's the war museum that ultimately were responsible for this. And and, and they, they've got sort of 34, 35, 40,000 interviews in the sound archive and uh, it's not to be forgotten and some historians won't use oral history because they say well he could be lying well as i pointed out diaries war diaries um, um memoirs they can all be bollocks in fact memoirs could be worse than them all especially written in the 1950s when they fictionalize it so they look out said bill as the shell burst through the turret 
uh, oh my god said Ted. you know it's got this it gives everybody words to say as and you don't get so much of that in oral history uh so it's all it's uh, i'm not knocking 1950s books really They're no just... no I'm, i mean i know exactly what i mean this is the you know this, the, the greater discussion about his geography but you know you're you're clearly a passionate advocate for oral histories and and firmly believe they have their place in in our understanding of history so you know i think it's like anything else there are good ones and there are bad ones and like anything else everything in moderation you know when if you're doing a study of, of, a, of a regiment at war war diaries in moderation aerial photos in moderation oral history in moderation and your own conclusions and analysis in moderate in moderation you put that all together and theoretically you've got some kind of um result at the end so well, um, in the first in the first world war the great war we call it uh, the all arms battle at the end and i believe in all arms history you use everything you've got and you don't denigrate other forms of history you you, you try and use it all there's no need to denigrate anything else you just i, I mean i know i have a pop a real pop at uh, war diaries but actually i use them i'm uh, i'm doing the 16th dli at the moment i've just photocopied every every single page of the war diary of the 16th DLI because it is absolutely important to, to make sure, make sure that you've got, when an oral historian says, to, you know, something, uh, sorry, uh, an oral history interview says something's happened, you've got to make sure it's on that day. Now, it's easy enough with Epsom and uh, although not towards the end of Epsom, you know, there's slight confusion to that I had to resolve. Uh, Goodwood's pretty easy. It's the 18th of July and then they all talk about the next day and, you know, you can follow that through. But I, I'm just been so lucky uh, to have had the job I did. And now in re so-called retirement, uh, working with Gary Bain, who's listening. Uh, <laughs> that's special memory. That's not for you, other listeners. That was just for Gary. Um, but um, that's like your friends. I don't know what you're like to people you don't know, Peter, honestly. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, friends, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um uh, i've, I've just been it's it, it's just so much fun history to me i'm enthused about it. people say why am i so enthusiastic because it's interesting because for, <laughs> carrie stop it <laughs> uh, because because it's interesting in itself and and it's exciting when you find things out and when you understand things that you didn't understand you must have had that you've been thinking oh, i just don't understand what's happening on ill one one two and then suddenly you get a bit of a uh, you know, normally someone like this and suddenly you understand it. Suddenly the interviews make sense. You know, oh, that's what's happening. Uh, and again, I just want to make quite sure people know. I don't think that the fi second five and four fire Yomri, five D four fires won the war. Uh, for instance, on Hill 112, the, the eighth, is it the eighth rifle brigade? Absolutely more important than the second five and four fire to holding the top of that hill. And without them, They'd have got because they they are at the center of it. Do you see what I mean? And there were other yeah. tank regiments up there. And by the way, can I go back to my initial point? They're all. Do you know those big counterattacks? Those lines on the map. They'd have probably succeeded, but for uh, yeah, that's them. Firstly, they were badly organized by the Germans, and I do believe that. And I, I looked at some German sources, uh, not in German, but some sources about that. But the second reason is the artillery bloody slammed them. And the, it, it's the 5.5s, batteries like these, the, the, of, of guns like 425 and 426 batteries of, of the South Nuts of Zars, 107 Regiment Royal Artillery. Are they the most important artillery regiment? No, they're one of Agra's. And by then, we've got the Agra's, the Army Group Royal Artillery. And this, just like when in history, in a battle, you've got all this. And don't get me started on logistics, which is absolutely crucial but it's not what we're talking about. But th without logistics, they would have had no ammunition, no fuel, no no food, no nothing. They they'd be had tanks are just immobile lumps of metal without logistics. Without the Remi and other organisations, they would they break down. In fact, they do break down anyway. But they break down, anyway. they break down more without the Remi. Yeah. Yeah, and and everybody's got their role. I'm not the the RAF are playing a vital part as well. Every it, it, it's all together. And I'm uh, you know when you write a one unit history, you're a little bit prone to people saying no, no, no. You think they've won the war? Well, we don't think that. But is their role worth reflecting? And my answer is yes. And we've done an hour. I, I might be rabbiting yeah. on. Well, I mean, I'll ask you one more question. But that yeah, idea yeah. of 
promoting one regiment is that's the band of brothers thing is that did that regiment that did that tv show highlight one unit yes have there been probably too many books on that one unit probably yes but has it helped understand through those with that one lens what the average experience of lots of other units are yes that's also a, 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 a definite yes and the same would apply to the you know james holland's book on the show at rangers and your yes. book on the wife and forefront the other books we know about about british units they well ronald yelters is watching who's who got the um the rifle brigade website about eighth battalion rifle brigade his work about that unit is highlighting their story but my last question to you is going to be peter is you know, you, you said at the beginning you're 67 years old. Where the uh, hell does the enthusiasm still come for for wanting to understand? Because we all know there are certain people who are writing or talking or guiding who you can sense the passion disappeared 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and they're still doing it, but it has become a job. Why is it no not still a job for you? I mean, obviously you are still earning and we all got to pay the bills. Where what, what how do you get up in I'm the morning more about this stuff? Um I, I'm I'm lucky in uh, I mean do you know one of the ways that when I'm bored of a, of a subject I've got a subscription to Commando War Comics digitally you know DC Thompson perfect yeah yeah and when I'm bored of it I read a couple of them I've just renewed my subscription and it sometimes you have to just say right I'm not in the mood and walk away. I was very much in the mood for this. This is the first from, I haven't done anything like this for bloody ages. They don't like me on TV much because um, I'm ugly. I wonder why. <laughs> well, I swear I'm ugly and I don't do what I'm told uh, is generally, uh, generally like you found when you asked me for some pictures and I said, Oh God, <laughs> you know, and I'm not very good at that kind of thing, but I, 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 I do not find Paul. I turn the question around. You've been doing it for years as well. The more you know, the more interesting it gets for me. Uh, as you find out the layers of detail, uh, the, the stories, the um, the individuals, the people, and 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 you know you're doing something, and you find out something else, and you follow it, and, and it's just so interesting. I've been interested in Gallipoli since I was bloody fourteen, and I've just come back from Gallipoli. I, I my interest has not died away a single bit. Is my interest in the Battle of the Somme the same as it was? No. Do you know why? Because it's been done to death. Um, I generally feel it has. Most other battles in the Great War I'm still interested in. Second World War, I'm more interested in units. Uh, but uh, I'm quite interested in Monte Cassino. Um, yeah. Yeah, but everybody else has written about that. Why would you want to? You've got Peter Caddick Sausage. Uh, I've forgotten his name. Peter Caddick Sausage. Yeah, yeah. Peter Caddick Adams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, but, you know, he's written. These people who know far more than I, I I'm not sure I could add much to or anything to what they say. So I think unit histories, I'm looking at 16th DLI next, and that's a real challenge because mm. I'll tell you, you ask what's different. In a tank unit, there's occasional vituperative rows. You know, normally someone doesn't like an officer, right, or something. In the infantry, where you're up close and personal, where people directly give you orders, and there are some majors, company commanders, who are loathed unfairly, by the way, within the unit. You have people slagging off sergeants, people accusing people of cowardice. People, and that's because for the infantry, it's a more relentless battle. For the, for the 54 fires, it's pretty relentless from June 44 to 45. If you're in, say, let's say a battalion in 50th Division, all right? You are in action pretty well when you're in action, on and off for five years. Yeah. A 50th yeah, Division. Uh, I mean, I know, it's uh, oral yeah. history again. Before they went in on D-Day, and they had to be broken up, I think, in September, because before they went on D-Day, they said, are there no, and I'm going to swear, because this is how they feel, are there no fucking Southern Divisions? And I know there's a, no, was it the 51st Division thought the same? No yeah. disrespect to Southern Division. This is, a, you see, what did you say, Paul, about perception? Yeah, that yeah, yeah. was the perception in the DLR. What it was was Montgomery wanted his experienced formations, but he went a bridge too far, a bloody gain with the 50th Division, who had to be broken up within a month or two, didn't they? You know, when they came ashore at D Day, an American sailor had to swim ashore with a rope because the lads in 8th Battalion just said, You can F right off. <laughs> Do you see what I yeah, mean? Uh, I mean, it, it, you're, 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 you're... Speaking to the converter, you're preaching to the choir here, you know. I, and 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 to, you asked me why why my passion go 
kit comes from is the fact that although I'm learning more, I'm also not afraid to understand I'll never get completely to the end of the tunnel and that, and that one one bit of learning just leads to another, you know, 10 different routes you can go to. Oh, my God, there's that. I've, I'm doing a New Zealand at war week coming up in a couple of weeks time. And there's an island in the Pacific. A, a guy has written about I had literally never heard of the island, let alone knew about the campaign. Now you're looking at it going. So a division and a half landed there. And I go, yep. And I, and I didn't I didn't know about it. And that some people might feel all kind of put off by that. I'm like, OK, it's something new. Another thing to deep dive into. And I'm looking on the map going, well, where the hell is this? Oh, it's there. And and that is, excites me and excites me to keep on a quest. Well, uh, yeah, for instance, I, 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 I'm do, I was doing something on Hague in the Sudan. God, the Sudan's interesting. Paul, I can't tell you. 1898, but the whole campaign. The end result is behind me, I've got three, four yards of Sudan books and a contract for a Sudan oh. book after the DLI. That, and there's new avenues. It's not, and you know, you'll move away one day from the Second World War. I know you don't believe it now, but in 20 years' time, you'll, you'll find other things. Military history is a huge subject that none of us really know more than just scratching the surface. There are yeah. some individuals that are brilliant, but most of us just just try. Oh, there are certain people who I feel that they, on their least working day, that they would consider a day off, is me in fifth gear. That's you know because I I can have days where I literally do nothing. I can sit not shaved in my sort of a pajamas and watch crappy TV all day. I can do that. And there are some people I think are always typing, always looking for stuff. I'm I I can have days off anyway. It's been fantastic. We've got loads of requests to bring you back again. I think we should definitely tackle the artillery side of things with the old South Knots Yeomanry because that's a fine body of men. Uh, Colin Bell, Steel Towers, all that kind of stuff there, uh, north of north of Corn. That'd be fascinating and do that. So um, we said we'd do about an hour. We've done an hour. I'm just going to drop you off screen and tell people what we've got coming up to, and I'm going to bring you back in to say goodbye in a second. So, folks, tomorrow I have two shows, double bill for you. So at uh, 4 p.m. UK time. I've got a wonderful filmmaker from the USA coming on who, when she was 20, just 20 years old, accompanied a busload of American veterans to Normandy and just spent, be, kind of became their granddaughter. And she's finally got her film out on DVD about traveling with these veterans and what it was like to be with them, sharing their experience. Mostly 29 Division guys, no half each. That'll be amazing. And then Marcus Brotherton, an old friend of mine, is coming on to join about this incredible story at 7 p.m. UK time about this 15 year old American who found himself on the Bataille on death march and survive years of captivity by the Japanese. That would be an amazing story. So that's coming up for you tomorrow. And then I'm going to take my break to go and do my D-Day stuff and be back with you after June. But I'm going to bring Peter back in to say goodbye, really. And um, have you enjoyed talking to our happy bunch of weirdos? Well, I have. I, I mean, I, I haven't been able because of my eyes. I can't really see all the things. I just there's, oh, there's there's a fascinating sidebar chat that I'll go back and read. And people are saying they want you back, so we'll 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 leave it at well, that. I've, I've got to say, I've, I've been looking up, forward to this all time again. And Ooh. we'll do the plug there. So the links to purchasing it are there below in the description, or you can Thank buy you. it at your favorite bookshop, whatever. And it's one of those books that will just go on the shelf, and it kind of. It fills in the gaps of, as you said, they're just exactly what it's like to be in an armoured regiment in World War II. It does what it says on the on the wrap, basically. Hooray. Ron Seal or whatever it was. Oh, yeah. Okay, then. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure, Peter, talking to you. So I will see you again sometime. This is Paul Woodadge for World War II TV saying I'll see you again for Double Bill tomorrow. Thank you for your time this evening. Cheers, everybody. Bye. <laughs>